Hello everybody. I am so happy that you have chosen to join us again this week for our Bible study. Um, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again we come asking that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. Father, we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we, if you remember, we finished article number 11 uh, last week and we are starting this week fresh on article number 12, which is the harmony of the law and the gospel. Our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good and that the inability which the scriptures ascribe to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin, to deliver them from which, and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. Yeah, that is one long sentence connected by commas and semicolons and it probably sounded like a bunch of goobie gaga. So our task today is to try and dissect all of that for easy understanding. So the goal is to take one section of that long sentence at a time. But first, let's start with the title itself, The Harmony of the Law and the Gospel. Most often when we, or at least me, when I think of harmony, I think of a, a symphony or I think of something that goes together real smooth, like Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers dance routine. Now, for those of you who are too young or just don't know who Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers is, you can Google it. Webster says that harmony is the combination of simultaneously sounded musical notes to produce chords and chords progression having a play pleasing effect. In other words, it, it, it is listening to a symphony of, of listening to different chords of music that is so pleasing that it puts a smile on your face. It's the Fred Astaire and Ginger dancing with such harmony that you can't take your eyes off them. Or, okay, here's another example of what comes to mind when I think of harmony, and one that most can relate to. It's Beyonce singing, at last, at the President's, uh, President Obama's inauguration, and he and Michelle dancing, looking intently into each other's eyes. It, it was like a harmonious thing. It all went together. So to me, that was harmonious. And it left a smile on my face. Uh, so hopefully you kind of get the point of what harmony, harmony is. So the harmony of the law and the gospel is like that symphony. It fits together perfectly. And the two together are pleasing. So what is the law and what do we believe about it? Our author writes, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government. So the law refers to the moral standards God has set for humans. It, it is what we are to live by on this earth. Um, it's the thing that, that puts us in harmony with God, with the earth that he's, he's given us. So God has written his law on every person's heart, the Jews as well as the Gentiles. From the moment we are born, God's law is written on our hearts. That's how even toddlers know when they're doing wrong. I mean, you can just, they can look at you and know they're doing wrong. And you know that they know 
that they're doing wrong. It's because the law of God is written on our hearts. Romans, the second chapter, verses 14 and 15, and this is the Good News Translation. It says, the Gentiles do not have the law, but whenever they do by instinct what the law commands, they are their own law. Even though they do not have the law, their conduct shows that what the law commands is written in their hearts. Their conscience also show that this is true, since their thoughts sometimes accuse them and sometimes defend them. So it, it, it's, you know, back to the two-year-old, back to the toddler, when they are obviously doing wrong and looking at you like, uh, yeah, then it's written in their hearts. They know their conscience has convicted them that they're doing wrong. The moment Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, everybody thereafter who were born was born with a sinful nature. And that makes it impossible for us to keep God's law. So our author tells us that the law of God is eternal and unchangeable, is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government. The moral law of God exists before man was even created. And the moral law of God will endure for eternity. God could not change nor alter one precept of his law in order to save us. The law is the foundation of God's government. It's unchangeable. It's, you cannot alter it. It's infinite and it's eternal. The next part of the long sentence that I authorize is that it is holy, just, and good. The it that he's referring to is the law. So he says the law is holy, just, and good. God is holy, therefore the law is holy. God is just, and he is good, therefore the law is just, and it is good. So because God is holy, he tells us in his word to be holy. Then the next part of that long sentence says, and the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin. So to paraphrase that, because it needs to be paraphrased, uh, it, it says, the scripture, it, to paraphrase it, the scripture says, the reason we as humans are not able to fulfill the teaching of the law is because of our fallen nature, which makes us love sin. All right. Next, our author says, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the holy law is one great end of the gospel. He is saying, in order for the law to deliver mankind from the inability to obey the law, and our inability to obey the law is because of sin, so in order to deliver us, it was necessary to restore us through a mediator. Because remember, we cannot save ourselves. It is through a mediator that we can have a sincere obedience to the holy law of God. We cannot of ourselves obey God's law. We have no desire for it. It is not, we, we have no, no, no taste for it, no, no desire. And, and that is the purpose of the gospel. Uh, to fair, paraphrase our author, he's saying one great end of the gospel is that through a mediator, we have the ability to obey God's law, which brings us back to the harmony of the law and the gospel. The law and the gospel is it, kind of a, a, a good cop, bad cop predicament. 
or it's a good news, bad news scenario. The bad news is that the whole world is guilty according to the law. That includes Jews as well as Gentiles. Romans 3 and 20 in the NIV version says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So no one here means every human being, uh, period, it, it is guilty under the law. The law makes no provisions for justification. The whole world is guilty. Nobody can boast about how righteous they are. Under the law, there is no hope. The law simply makes us conscious of sin. To use an easy example, it's the, the speed limit. The speed limit, when you pass by it, especially if you're speeding, it makes you conscious of the fact that you are breaking the law. And, 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 and it does not have a, a sign or something saying, that's okay, I forgive you. No. The, the law is, is in stone. It, it's, it's, it's hard. It's not, it's not bending. It's, there's no grace associated with the law. Under the law, there is no hope. That's the bad news. But that's not the end of the story. The next verse starts with a but, B-U-T. Romans 3, 21 and 22, again, the NIV version says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So, a conjunction, but, B-U-T, gives us hope. There's hope in the but. It's a righteousness from God that is totally separate from the law has been made known. That's the mediator. This righteousness it is, is not about doing the law, but believing in the mediator. It comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And it is not just for the Jews. It's for all who believe. So bad news and good news. Bad news is that because of our sinful nature, it's impossible for us to obey the law. But the good news is that because of Jesus Christ, we don't have to. God gives us a righteous status through faith in Jesus Christ that has nothing to do with obeying the law. I ran across a comical story for an example. And, and, and it presents a good example. It's a good example of a good news, bad news situation. Here's the story. The doctor told his patient, I have some bad news and some good news. Of course, this is always the heart decision. Do you want the good news first or the bad news first? The patient said, okay, doc, give me the good news first. So the doctor said, the test show that you have only 24 hours to live. Of course, the patient was stunned and worried because if that was the good news, what was the bad news? So he asked the doctor, if the good news is that I only have 24 hours to live, what in the world is the bad news? And the doctor says, I forgot to call you yesterday. <laughs> So when I first read that, every time I read it, it cracks me up. Of course, it, it you know, it may be my warm sense of humor, but it still cracks me up. So the final end or the final part or the end of our long sentence says, and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So we're still speaking of the gospel, the good news. He says, through a mediator, which is Christ Jesus, we have possibilities. It is the good news of the gospel that restores us. 
to a pre-sin state, which makes us want to obey God's law. And it is the grace to and it is the grace to establish the visible church. Now I will end by reading what our author says we believe about the harmony of the law and the gospel. And hopefully this time it will make a it will have a little more clarity. All right, here we go. He says, we believe that the law of God is the eternal and unchangeable rule of his moral government, that it is holy, just, and good, and that the inability which the scripture ascribes to fallen men to fulfill its precepts arises entirely from their love of sin. Simply put, He's saying, because of our love of sin, we cannot fulfill the law of God. Then he goes on, to deliver them from which and to restore them through a mediator to unfeigned obedience to the law, to the holy law, is one great end of the gospel. Simply put again, because of our inability to obey scripture, God provides the gospel or the gospel provides a mediator who is Jesus Christ to deliver us from our tendency to a real obedience. And then finally he says, and of the means of grace connected with the establishment of the visible church. So, still to paraphrase the whole thing, it's saying that we as sinners, because of our love for, for uh, sin, cannot obey God's law. Therefore, God provided a mediator who is Jesus Christ to take away our tendencies for sin and give us a love of the gospel. And the gospel is such that it provides, the it, it restores us and it provides grace uh, through the church, which we can physically see. So hopefully all of that makes sense because we are now on article number 12, the harmony between the law and the gospel. And hopefully throughout this study, we will see that the law and the gospel work together. It is not the law over here and the gospel over here or the Old Testament over here and the New Testament over here. All of it is one, and it works together in harmony. Hopefully, you got it, or at least you've got a smidgen of it. Until next time, be blessed and come back and join us as we continue our study of the harmony between the law and the gospel. Bye-bye.